Okay, great. So it is a great pleasure to have back after a six year hiatus of pandemic and otherwise, Dr. Jeffrey Gold. Um, Dr. Gold is entering his 25th year at UCSD, has it really been Dr. Gold? That's almost as long as you. Uh, where he completed his MD degree, his PhD in neurosciences, his residency in child neurology, and fellowship in clinical neurophysiology. He is board certified in child neurology, clinical neurophysiology, and epilepsy. He is the course director for the neurology courses for the first and second year students at UCSD School of Medicine, and is the program director for the Child Neurology Residency Training Program, which is a big, big responsibility. He is the medical director of the UCSC Ready Children's Neonatal Neurology Program. And I'm going to hand you these couple of little items and appreciation and turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeffrey. And it sounds like I have the uh, unenviable task of competing with lunch. Do um, <laughs> not let me uh, uh, get in the way. So uh, they want me to talk today about MRI findings. And I understand from having done this for a very long time that there is a real danger of the, uh, what I call the what's wrong with this MRI game, where I click and say, here's an MRI that has abnormalities and tell you about it. Then I click on the next one and say, here's another one. And I find that to be of very little utility, especially because most of you have one affected child, and the odds that I would hit the one thing that was interesting to you would be fairly low. Um, so I wanted to take more of a global view to talk a little bit about what MRI is, why we do them, what they can and can't tell us, which might help you decide whether you need one or want one or if you've had one, what it might mean and what the benefits and the limitations are. We are a lunch talk. We're informal around here. If you got a question, just throw it right up there and we can go ahead and answer it. You know, we don't need to, to be overly didactic in a, in a lunch and learn session. So we can go ahead and get started with the basic question of why are we talking about MRI at all? Because MRI is the best tool we have for looking at the structure of the brain. And any time the brain is not behaving normally, uh, resulting in abnormal movements or any other kind of problem, the first instinct people have is to say, well, let's take a look and see if we can see something that's wrong. That's always been the instinct of doctors. Um, but before about 1900, there was really no way to look and know whether the structure of the brain was normal. Um, you could do that after somebody passed away. You can cut it up and look at it under a microscope and try to find whether all the cells are where they should have been. But that's obviously a very little utility uh, to the awake and behaving people. So when they first invented x-ray, people thought that would be a good way to look at the brain. Turned out not to be. Um, the brain is all soft tissue. X-ray, not so good at looking at soft tissue. So most of x-rays that you send at people bounce off the skull. It uh, doesn't turn out to be that helpful. Um, when they invented CT scans, things got a little bit better. CT scans are just fancy x-rays that you pass through the skull from multiple different angles and then a computer reconstruction into a picture of the brain. Uh, but it really wasn't until MRI comes along uh, in the 50s and 60s and then gets improved in the 70s and 80s that we really had a good way of looking at brain structure. We're going to talk a little bit more about how MRI works so that you can understand the benefits and the limitations of it. So um, all MRI can do is tell us about the structure of the brain. And so I want to talk a little bit about that before you immediately jump to thinking that, oh, I definitely, uh, we haven't had one, and I definitely need one. Think about a computer. And think about a computer that's that for some reason not working right. You're clicking on stuff and stuff doesn't open up. You type in something and the letters that appear on the screen aren't the letters that you want them to be. What are the odds that opening up the computer and looking at the pieces of it are going to tell you what's wrong with the computer? Very small, right? Most of the problems that we deal with are problems in the software, right? Or problems in the computer program and how it's written or something crashed in the RAM buffer. And, and nothing about looking at the structure of the computer is going to tell you what's wrong with the functional output that you're seeing on the screen. 
So most of the questions that you have about why does my child do this or you know what's going on with that can't really be addressed by looking at the basic structure of the brain. Um, the uh, most of the time the benefits will accrue by looking at the actual electrical activity that the brain is producing, which is EEG, a whole separate thing we're not going to talk about today. Or most importantly, by looking at the behavioral outputs of the brain, doing the types of things that you heard about in the previous talk with neuropsychiatric assessments or neurologic examinations or psychiatric and behavioral assessments or cognitive behavioral therapy. That is a much better way of saying what is the brain capable of doing and how can we make uh, the brain do what we want it to do better. Um, very little of that comes from looking at the structure of the brain, which I know is not what everybody wants to hear. What everybody wants to hear is we can take a picture, we can see an injury, and that will tell us what kind of treatment can improve a behavior. That essentially never happens in neurology. Essentially never. Um, we do MRIs when we're worried about learning problems, behavioral problems, developmental problems, seizures, or problems of movement like cerebral palsy, because seeing the injury can help us understand it, and for the very bad reason that a lot of the time insurance companies insist on seeing something physically wrong before they will approve a therapy that has nothing to do with fixing something that's physically wrong. Right. So we don't understand why insurance companies insist on this, but oftentimes having an abnormal MRI gets you approved for a behavioral therapy. Makes no sense, but there it is. So, um, so most of the time we're doing pictures to look at whether there are um, structural problems in the brain, even though we know it's not going to directly tell us why we're having certain um, um, behaviors or other things that, that we want to address. There are not one, there are not any one specific finding that children with 11Q have. Um, every you know the, the the old saying I'm sure you've heard it a thousand times probably even today. You see one child with 11Q, you see one child with 11. That's it, right? Every child is different. Um, and so if you look through the medical literature or if you come to a conference like this and meet lots of folks, you will find that some folks have a completely 100% normal MRI when they have one in the past. Others have specific uh, problems, and others have things that have only ever been seen in them, and thus it's unclear whether that's a feature of 11Q or just a feature of that child. Um, some things that, that are seen in, um, in multiple children, so there are um, there's white matter abnormalities, in, including white matter edema or swelling, especially prominent in younger children with 11Q that tends to resolve as they get older. Um, the finding of trigonocephaly, uh, which is the single most commonly cited specific thing that is found in children with 11Q, and we'll take a look at that. I found reports of cerebral cysts. I found reports of periventricular nodule heterotopia. We'll talk a little bit about what all of that means um, and what finding that on, um, on imaging tells us. So first, a very brief little bit about how MRI works. I think we have a little bit too much mysticism in medicine. We have a little too much where you go to the room and talk to the oracle, and the oracle says, I'm going to do some, a magical ceremony, and then the magical ceremony occurs, and then the oracle comes back and tells you what the results of the magical ceremony was, and I don't think that that's beneficial to anybody. I think it's useful to hear what happens in an MRI machine, um, and I think you're all perfectly capable of, of understanding that. Um, it's true that the details are a lot of quantum physics, but the concept is pretty easy to understand. So most of the brain is water, and most of water is hydrogen, right? So every water molecule is one oxygen and two hydrogen molecules. 70% of your body is water, right? Two-thirds of, of, of water is hydrogen, and so most of the brain is, is water. And, um, and every oxygen molecule is shaped like this with an oxygen here and two hydrogens coming off of it. And oxygen is negatively charged and hydrogen is positively charged. So that makes a little magnet, right? Just like a magnet that you're all familiar with that has a north pole and a south pole, oxygen, you know, water molecules have a positive pole and a negative pole because of their oxygen and, and hydrogen. So what they figured out was that if you send very specific radio frequency pulses at a water molecule, it hits it and puts the energy of the radio wave into the water molecule, which causes it 
to spin mm -hmm. in a quantum sense, but you can think of it as spinning. And then you put, so you put energy in, it starts spinning. As that spinning slows down, the radio energy that you put in comes back. It's just like shouting into the Grand Canyon, you go echo, and then a little bit later you hear back echo. You put radio waves in, water spins, you get radio waves coming back out it at, at you. That's the resonance in magnetic resonance imaging. All right. And the magic of MRI is that different parts of the brain have different amounts of water, right? So the gray matter, which has all of these brain cells in it, has a lot more water than the white matter, which has all these connections between cells. The fluid spaces of the brain, the ventricles, are all just basically pure water. So if you send a radio frequency pulse at gray matter, you get one kind of signal back because of the amount of water in it. If you send a radio pulse at the skull, or you get a different pulse again. And so by doing that, you can have a computer reconstruct how much water is at specific points inside the head, and then it makes it into a picture that our eyes can interpret as a, as a brain. All right. Um, and that is all the magical MRI machine is doing. It's a big magnet and a bunch of radio frequency pulses that are making all of those water molecules line up, making them spin by hitting them with radio waves, listening for the radio waves that come back, and then drawing you a picture of how much water is at different places in the brain. All right. Um, so the, the final thing is that we've been doing this long enough that we know what it looks like when part of the brain didn't develop normal, right? What the water molecule, how the water molecules line up in specific kinds of, of developmental abnormality. We know what it looks like if you've had a stroke, right? And the, the, the brain first swells up and then the brain cells die and get replaced entirely by water. So you look at the brain and you can see a big spot where there's a whole lot of water where there wasn't water before. And you can deduce from that that there was a, that there was a stroke. So because we've been doing this for so long and, and we know what all the patterns of abnormality are, we can get a pretty good idea about what's going on in the head by our little process of looking at, looking at, at water molecules. So um, when the computer makes its images, it can make them in a number of different ways that help us interpret them. Um, so I am looking straight on at you. And if you move from my eyes to the back of my head, you would be moving in what's called the coronal plane, right? That's, that's this one. Oops, that's not good. There we go. That's this one over here. So this is coronal. This is like somebody looking straight at you. And every time you, you click, you move back further and further in the brain. So this is me standing straight on. If you're looking in my ear, all right, that's a sagittal picture. You're looking through the ear and then you're looking through all the pieces from the left ear to the right ear. If you floated above me and looked straight down, right, that's called an axial picture. And you get different pictures as you move from the top of the brain to the bottom of the brain. The computer doesn't care. It knows how to make those reconstructions, but some people like to look at the brain in different, in different orientations. If you think of a skull that you've ever seen on TV or whatever, that's always in a coronal plane, right? You're always looking in the eyes of the skull, but that isn't always the best way to look at the, the features and structures of the brain. So when we look at an MRI, the computer will can reconstruct it so we can look at it in any direction that we find interesting. So um, what structures might they tell you about? Well, here we are on a sagittal picture of the brain. This is like you're looking in someone's ear. And this is right in the middle. This is like a cut right through the very, the very middle of the brain. And this right here, this very bright, very dense thing, is called the corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is the main connection between the left side and the right side of the brain. So there are a lot of places in the left brain that want to talk to the right brain and vice versa. And the way they do that is they send a, a wire, just like a phone wire, from the left side to the right side. They have to cross somewhere. And 80% of the connections between the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain cross in the corpus callosum. So as you can imagine, that's one of the first things they want to look at is, is the corpus callosum there? Is it in the right place? Is it as big as it's supposed to be? This is a good opportunity to dispel. Uh, oh, I can do that next way. Um, and then, so right underneath the corpus callosum is a big structure called the thalamus. The thalamus is responsible for receiving all of the input that the brain is going to get. Every vision, 
photon that hits your eye stops in the thalamus before it goes to the brain. Every time you touch your finger, that sensation stops in the thalamus before it goes to the brain. And so by looking at the thalamus, you can tell whether or not you know, sensations and things like that are getting into the brain or have a normal pathway into the brain. Below that, you have the, the brain stem, which is the most basic part of the brain. Every animal has a brain stem, right? From dogs and cats. They don't all have this big, beautiful cortex and this big, beautiful corpus callosum. Those are kind of human y kind of stuff. But every animal has a brain stem and it looks kind of like this. And these areas control all the super basic stuff heart rate, breathing, temperature regulation, stuff like that. Um, and that's broken down in this part, which is called the, 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 the midbrain. Here is the, the pons and here's the medulla. And then that trails down into the spinal cord. Um, it's also worth pointing out that when these things are developing in the embryo when the baby is still inside of mom, there, it develops as a tube that then specializes as we get older and bigger. It, there isn't really a difference between the spinal cord and the medulla, and all of this is just starts out as the same stuff that specializes over the course of that over the course of development. Right behind the cerebellum, uh, right behind the um, brainstem is the cerebellum, and believe it or not, there are about as many neurons here as there are all through here, and its main job is coordination. It doesn't do anything with strength. It doesn't do anything with sensation. But your ability to reach and pick something up, that's almost entirely the cerebellum. It coordinates your, your vision's ability to look and see what you want to pick up, and then coordinates all your fingers and everything as you reach toward it. And so injuries to the cerebellum tend to produce uh, uh, difficulty walking because you stumble around. If you are a person who uh, enjoys the occasional alcoholic beverage, like I will be able to do later with the uh, with what I was given, um, alcohol is a cerebellum toxin. So when you take alcohol, uh, it makes the cerebellum not work so well. So every, almost everything that happens with your movement with, when you are drinking alcohol, that's because the cerebellum didn't, didn't, didn't work right. So um, I've always thought that this looks like a hummingbird. Anybody see a hummingbird here with a head, a belly, and a big tail, and then the wings of the hummingbird right back there? So I always teach the medical students that the first thing they do when they look at an MRI is they should go to the middle of the sagittal view and find the hummingbird and make sure that uh, make sure that the the brain stem and the cerebellum are all looking looking normal. So you know if you have ever had an MRI and they told you something like the corpus callosum is small. They came to an image just like this. They looked at this and they said, this is what it should look like, but ours isn't this big. Um, and that is, turns out, the most common abnormality of the brain in all people. Um, there, it, it is, I struggle to find a case where the correct answer to the question, the most common abnormality in the brain in fill in the blank condition is, it's, it's almost always the small, absent, or thin corpus callosum. Um, it's just the most common abnormality in all people, and thus it's the most common abnormality in, in, um, in, in most disease conditions. So again, this is what normal should look like, and this is what no corpus callosum at all looks like, right? And so here you see a normal, you can see it right there, and here you can just see that it's just, it's not there, right? The structure just simply isn't there. Yeah. Over, over here, this is what we would call dysgenesis. So there's a pretty normal looking corpus callosum here in the front half of the brain, but there's no corpus callosum here in the back half of the brain. So here we have the most common, most classic, most characteristic thing that we find to be abnormal when we take an MRI in anybody. But if we do a research study where we just enroll the next thousand people who walk into the target nearest here, and we get an MRI in all of them, we will find something like 10 out of those thousand who have no corpus callosum. And they've never had a problem a day in their life. Their IQ is normal. They walk normally. They don't have cerebral palsy. They don't have epilepsy. They just don't have a corpus callosum. Something happened developmentally that when they were born, instead of all of those crossing fibers coming together and crossing in the same place, they all crossed kind of in their own, in their own random place. Many of you who got here from the airport came down the five freeway. Right? Think of the five freeway as like the corpus callosum from the airport to Carlsbad. It's the easiest, best, and fastest way. But if for whatever reason, when they constructed San Diego, if they didn't build the five freeway, you could still get to Carlsbad on a bunch of city streets. 
Might take a little bit longer than normal, but you can still get there. So half of all people who are born with no corpus callosum at all have never had a neurologic problem a day in their life. But any neurologic problem, if you look at an MRI, the single most common finding will be an absent corpus callosum. And this is one of the reasons that I said that during this talk and then immediately going back to your primary care physician, neurologist, or psychiatrist and saying, we need an MRI. I need to see if there's anything wrong with the brain. Well, if you don't see a corpus callosum, it's not clear that that has anything to do with any abnormal movement or behavior or seizure that your child has ever had. There are plenty of folks who don't have those things who have no corpus callosum. So anyway, so that would be a that would be an example of, of the most common abnormality that we that we see on MRI. All right. The second most common abnormality that we see is hydrocephalus. A great doctor trick that I'm guessing you have all learned by now is we just say stuff in Latin or Greek so that you don't understand it and then we charge you for having said it in Latin. <laughs> right? So hydro just means water and cephalus just means head. So we decided we didn't want to tell you that children have water head. We decided we wanted to hydrocephalus <laughs> better. Right? Um, and so many of you may have been told at some point that your child has hydrocephalus. Right? And all that means is that the fluid spaces of the brain are larger than they normally are. There is more hydro inside your cephalus. And so in the normal picture here, the lateral ventricles separate the left hemisphere from the right hemisphere of the brain, and they kind of look like that. And the third ventricle is really hard to see, but it would be right here if we could see it. And then the fourth ventricle is down here, separating the pons from the cerebellum. And these are kind of the normal sizes that those fluid spaces should be. If, if we do an MRI and those are the sizes of your fluid spaces, we don't say you have hydrocephalus. But here is a child with hydrocephalus. And this is hydrocephalus for a very specific reason that's called aqueductal stenosis. If you see the midbrain right here and the structures that are, that are right behind it of the pectum, there's a little fluid space that runs between those two things. And that's called the cerebral aqueduct. In some people, for some reason, that gets clogged and the fluid can't get from up here to down here because it can't get through the cerebral aqueduct just like a sink whose drain is blocked. So that has happened here and the fluid can't get through. And so all the fluid builds up behind it, right? And so this would be a child who has lateral ventricle and third ventricle hydrocephalus as a result of aqueductal stenosis. And if you took the picture from the top down, the axial picture, where we move it down, we might see really big fluid spaces like this. This is just this picture, but looking top down through about right here, all right? Now, this would be a really important thing to find on an MRI, because if you can't move fluid from here to here, the brain's not gonna stop making fluid. Right, it's going to be a tap that's on and a drain that's blocked. What happens when the tap is on and the drain is blocked? The sink overflows. But the sink can't overflow in the skull because the skull is closed and fused. So what happens is this fluid just keeps building up. The pressure inside the head goes up and up and up and up. And eventually the brain gets so squished it stops working. Right. Um, and so hydrocephalus can be a dangerous, even life-threatening problem. And so, you know, there are, there are children for whom we're doing MRIs because of headaches, because of new and worsening seizures, because of new and difficulty problems moving the eyes or problems breathing. And when we get the MRI, a brain that used to look like this now looks like this. And we desperately need to send a neurosurgeon in to find a way to drain off that fluid, ideally permanently, um, in order to prevent those problems from getting worse and progressing all the way up to bad consequences, up to and including death. So at the end of this talk, I've got a slide that says something like, do I need an MRI? And our main indications for needing an MRI are new changes, new things that are happening to look for problems like this that might need urgent intervention. So if you have new headaches where you never had headaches before, if you have new seizures where you never had seizures before, new problems with eye movements or movement of the body, those are great times to get an MRI to look for problems like this that might be urgently and emergently action. I so. All right. Um, next up, our most common classic and famous finding in 11Q, which is trigonocephaly. Ironically, trigonocephaly is not really a neurologic problem per se. Um, the brain does not seem to care very much what the shape of the skull is. 
Here across the bottom of the slide, I've got a number of different um, skull shape abnormalities that do not necessarily imply anything about neurologic or behavioral abnormalities. There are lots and lots of folks um, with plagiocephaly and brachycephaly who have never had a neurologic problem a day in their life. Their head is a little bit of a funny shape. They have a real problem finding hats that fit, but they don't have any neurologic problem whatsoever. In 11Q, for reasons that I don't understand, but maybe smarter people do, the metopic suture, that would be that one right there, fuses in an unusual way. And thus, instead of the front of the skull developing a rounded shape, like here, it develops a pointy shape, like here. Um, it looks more like a triangle. You get how we made that sound more medical by just putting Latin words together? <laughs> Tricephaly, right? Triangle head. <laughs> it wasn't that hard, was it? But there it is. So um, for that reason of the early fusion of these sutures, the, the front of the head takes on this kind of heavy shape. Here is what a CT or MRI scan might look like. Instead of having a rounded front like this, it has a pointy front like that. And again, that doesn't really have any consequence for the function of the brain as far as we can tell. The brain can have a little pointy uh, area at the front rather than a rounded front, and that doesn't seem to disrupt its ability to do any of its business. But nevertheless, it is something that we do see fairly commonly in, in 11Q. Rarely do we get that fixed uh, or addressed. You can. You can have a neurosurgeon break the metopic suture and then wear a helmet that shapes the front of the skull into a more rounded shape. There just isn't a really good reason to do that most of the time. There may be some folks for whom the drainage of the blood through the veins at the front of the skull is having trouble draining because of the abnormal shape. And then the neurosurgeons might really go and do something like that. Um, it's, a, it's a rarity. It doesn't happen most of the time. Most kids with trigonocephaly don't, don't go through that kind of surgical procedure. But it can be done. And I have seen it done rarely where that needs to happen. Um, we do have kids who have uh, plagiocephaly or brachycephaly for whom the parents are very worried about the cosmesis. And if, uh, and if you do, if you put on a helmet before the soft spot fuses, um, it will naturally, it will naturally mold itself to the sides of the helmet. So it turns out that the soft spot uh, stays open until you're about a year old. And it does that to allow the brain to assume kind of its normal shape. So if you recognize trigonocephaly before the, 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 the anterior fontanelle fuses, you can wear a helmet and probably even that. Um, if you don't figure out about it until after the suture is fused, there's nothing to be done other than to have the, other than to have the neurosurgeons break the, break the suture. And there's usually not a good reason to do that. So trigonocephaly, the most commonly specifically cited thing in 11Q, um, rarely if ever causing neurologic problems in and of itself. All right. Um, the next most commonly cited issue in uh, in 11Q um, is our white matter abnormalities. So the way that the brain is made, um, the the brain cells are all born. I'm going to back up to a a, a, a typical picture because I like this one a bit better. Um, we're going to go back to there we go. Um, so here's our our coronal picture of the brain as we as the brain is developing. All the stem cells live around the fluid spaces, right? So they all live here around the edges of the fluid spaces or here around the edges of the fluid spaces. And during development in the first 20 weeks of a pregnancy, those stem cells become mature neurons. And then they move to the outside of the brain. They look for the very outsides and they all set up shop there. And this happens literally trillions of times. Every stem cell living along these borders makes itself into a mature brain cell and sends that brain cell out to the periphery and then does it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. again. Um, and so when development is done, almost all of the brain cells are living out here on the edge of the brain. And then they all those brain cells send out connections so they can talk to other brain cells or so they can talk to the spinal cord and tell the body to move or things like that. And so when you look at this picture, on the outside, you're looking at brain cell, and then all of this color, which does look whiter, to be fair, is called the white matter, and it's the connections between the brain cells and, and, other, and other parts of, of the brain and the body. 
So for example, in this picture, this is the corpus callosum right here. And so there's a brain cell here, and it'll send out a connection that goes across the corpus callosum and talks to a brain cell over there, right? That's that's kind of how the, the, the brain organizes, um, organizes itself. This leads to the most pervasive myth in neurology that just bothers the heck out of me every time I hear it on TV. How many of you have heard something like, we only use 10% of our brain, right? Everybody's heard something like that. Anybody who said that you can just write off forever as knowing what they're talking about. <laughs> what they mean by that, or what the, the nugget of information that they have misunderstood is that only 10% of the brain by volume or structure is brain cell, and the rest of it is connection. So like, look at this picture. This is where the brain cells live, and all of this is white matter. That doesn't mean that we don't use it. That would be like saying that you know, most of the phone system that we talk with when we used to talk on old wired telephones, most of the system was the wires, right? We all had one handset in our house, but then think of all the trillions and trillions of wires that would go from our house you know, to a central switching station and the central switching station to every other house. Those wires are important to the use of the phone. Right, it's not just the receiver that you're holding. So in that metaphor, the brain cells are like the receivers of the phone, but these white matter connections are unbelievably important. The brain doesn't work without them. So only 10% of the brain is brain cells by volume. Most of it is these white matter connections. But I promise you, we use the white matter connections just as much as we use the cells of the brain. So, um, so uh, but it turns out, that this white matter stuff is much more susceptible to injury and malformation than our brain cells. I would like you to do something you probably haven't done today, which is think about Shaquille O'Neal. Um, <laughs> so Shaq's about seven feet tall, right? And somewhere right about here in Shaq is a brain cell that tells his big toe what to do. And so that brain cell is the same size as every other brain cell in the body. But its white matter connection has to go all the way from here, all the way through his brain, all the way through his cervical spinal cord and his thoracic spinal cord and his lumbar spinal cord to get to the sacral spinal cord where it finds another neuron that it relays the signal to the big toe to. In Shaq, that might be like a four foot long connection <laughs> between the brain and the bottom of his spinal cord. And as you can imagine, it's really hard for the body to maintain that. If the if something goes wrong in his cervical in his sacral spinal cord, a repair enzyme has to be made all the way up here and shift for all the way down that white matter track down to fix that problem at the end of that of that nerve. And so, if there's anything that's wrong in the body, or some problem with oxygen, or some problem with sugar, or anything else like that, the white matter tends to start to die, tends to show signs of injury before the brain cells themselves actually do. And so people with diabetes, right, people with anemia are much more likely to show problems with their white matter than they are with the brain cells themselves. And if there's something wrong with the way brain cells were made to begin with, something wrong with their ion channels or their DNA or anything else, the white matter is more likely to show that injury than the gray matter. And that is a very belabored way of saying that when we take pictures of children with 11Q, we often see that the white matter has this extra bright appearance, that the white matter is, is, is taking on more water, is taking on more, uh, more edema, than other parts of, of the brain are. And, and if we compare the brain of a child with 11Q to the brain of a child who doesn't have 11Q, we're more likely to see something like this, that the white matter is either made in an un unusual way or taking on fluid in an unusual way. And the, um, the result of that is that the neurons aren't sending their electrical signals to the other parts of the brain and to the body in a, in a completely normal way because their connections are, are injured, right? The signal isn't getting where it needs to go. Imagine if every phone wire, right, was, you know, 10% of them were short circuiting at any one given time, you, you wouldn't be getting the signal from where you were sending it to where you wanted it quite as well. But 
It's everywhere in the brain all at once. All of the white matter is having this problem. So there's not one specific behavior or activity that you could reliably say is going to be unusual in a child who's having this kind of white matter edema. Maybe some of them would be having problems learning language. Maybe others would be having problems with coordinated movement, right? Maybe others would be having problems with behaviors that weren't the typical behaviors for a child of their age. And so you could see that if we did an MRI because we suspected that there was a learning problem or something like that, we might see something like this and it might help us say, yes, we can see that there's something wrong, but any problem could cause this, right? Any problem with sodium channel, dry ion channels or anything else, yes. Question online, is this the same for deletions and duplications? It very well could be. And I have seen images just like this in patients with 11Q or not 11Q, in patients with deletions or duplications or um, infections or um, certain kinds of like uh, drowning. Drowning might look like this where all of the neurons are running out of oxygen at the same time. And so they all start taking on extra fluid at the same time. You might very well see something, something like that. There are medications you can take that alter the way neurons use energy and get rid of the waste products of energy um, uh, maintenance. And the white matter begins to take on fluid just like that. Um, the studies that I'm referencing here show that if you take multiple pictures in children with 11Q at many points in their lives, you see that this bright white matter signal often tends to go away or at least get a little bit better as they get older. And again, that doesn't necessarily correlate with them doing better in school or having more typical behaviors or displaying better memory or anything like that. It's, it's just a finding that we see on MRI that younger children with 11Q often have more of these prominent white matter findings than, than older, older folks with, with 11Q. Um, I am spared the thing that often happens when I'm giving talks to a general audience about MRI, which is I don't have to put up my slide about MRI and typical aging, uh, because if you're over 30, I'm afraid your brain doesn't look anything like this anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you are all developing something that looks a lot like mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but, uh, I, I, I want to tell you, I usually have to show you, but not today. We're not talking about <laughs> Another finding that I have seen reported in 11Q, although again, I don't know that it is specific to 11, it's definitely not specific to 11Q, I don't know if it has anything to do with the pathophysiology of 11Q, are cerebral cysts. So this would be an example of a cerebral cyst. Here we are looking at an axial view of the brain, we're probably above looking straight down. You can see some fluid spaces up here and some fluid spaces back here. This looks a little bit extra bright. We might have a little bit of edema going on in that area. But we also have this spot, this, this area of fluid where there shouldn't be fluid. And that, and that, you can see that here. You can see three of them right there. You can see in the different picture there, you can see the fluid inside of them that we're just looking at them in different, using different physics techniques to turn water light or dark, because sometimes that helps us. Um, so these are little cerebral cysts, and you can get these for a lot of different reasons. Um, a particular presidential candidate recently disclosed, disclosed that they had um, a worm that got into their brain, probably a condition called neurosister sarcosis, about 5% of our Southern California population, if you would like to come on down to Children's and look at that. Um, but the, the fourth tapeworm gets in and it makes a cyst and then the tapeworm dies. But if you get an MRI, that's what you see. You see the cyst that the, that the, 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 the tapeworm used to live in. Um, if you had a small stroke, what we call a lacunar stroke, you might have something that looks like that. Um, if you have the brain during development, for whatever reason, something happened during the developmental pro process that blocked neurons from going to that certain area, um, then um, no neurons would go there. And so fluid would take the place where there were no neurons. So you could get cerebral cysts for any of those reasons. Um, and I don't know why this particular person has them. And I, again, I, that's not a typical finding in 11Q, but it's been reported enough that we can find it in the medical literature. Um, and so could this be a problem of something that happened at birth and there was a little stroke? Maybe. Could it be that this person had 11Q and also ate some pork that had a tapeworm in it? Absolutely possible, right? So the MRI can't tell us why we have a cyst. It can just tell us that we do have one. 
And I can tell you that there are many, many perfectly normal people who have a cyst. My dad has an arachnoid cyst right down here that he, they found him. He was having headaches, so they got it. They said he has an arachnoid cyst, and, and he's been obsessed with it every day since they found it. And I've tried to show him every article that shows 10% of people have at least one arachnoid cyst. It doesn't make him feel any better, um, but it doesn't have anything to do with why he has headaches or, or any of his other problems. He doesn't have that many. He's great. <laughs> um, so uh, another report I found was periventricular nodular heterotopia, which sounds really fancy, except peri just means around, ventricle just means ventricle, just means the fluid spaces, the ventricles. Nodular just means a nodule. Um, and hetero means, means different made, differently made, differently made nodules around the ventricle. Uh, we say it so we can charge more. Um, so <laughs> the fluid spaces are supposed to be nice and smooth. They're supposed to be like this, nice and smooth. But here you can see that they're not, they're irregular, right? You can see that they, they have a shape that is not nice and smooth. And the reason for that is, remember that I told you that all the brain cells are born there during development, and then they're supposed to move out. There are a number of genetic conditions like tuberous sclerosis, where the brain cells get made, but they don't move. They just stay and live along the border of the ventricle. And you get these dense little balls of, of neurons that are not doing what neurons are supposed to do. And so you get these irregular borders along the ventricles, periventricular nodular heterotopia. It doesn't surprise me to learn that there was a child with 11Q who had some brain cells that were born that didn't migrate out to where they were supposed to go. Doesn't happen to every child with 11Q, but clearly something on 11Q is necessary for the normal migration of neurons. And in this child, but not every child, um, those neurons never moved. They never went to where they were supposed to go, which means two different things. One, that out here, there are not the typical number of neurons arranged in the, in the typical way. So you would imagine that whatever those neurons were supposed to do isn't getting done in the typical way. On the other hand, it also means there are a bunch of abnormal neurons living here, forming connections that aren't normally formed. And we know from long experience that these often make seizures. When you have neurons that clump together in abnormal places, they make unusual electrical activity, and that's a common cause of seizures. Um, and so this is tuberous sclerosis. This is not a living tumor. Tuberous sclerosis is the most common condition with nodular heterotopia. So I could find a lot more examples of nodular heterotopia and tuberous sclerosis than I could hear. This might be an important thing to know. So if you have, if your child has seizures and they've tried many seizure medicines and the seizures don't stop, if they got an MRI that found periventricular nodular heterotopia, they might say, well, we could do some advanced epilepsy techniques to figure out if some of these nodules are making most of the seizures. And if they are, fancy pants neurosurgeons who drive Lamborghinis could use <laughs> lasers to destroy those bad neurons and the seizures might stop. Something we do down at Children's every day is evaluations for children with seizures whose seizures aren't stopping. We look for other things we could do that might make the seizure stop. And if you had something like periventricular nodular heterotopia, and there were a particular nodule that was making most of the seizures, we might be able to have the neurosurgeons improve that for us. So do I need an MRI? Well, if you have seizures, probably, to see if it's from a cause like this. If you have seizures that aren't stopping despite the usual things that make seizures stop, absolutely, because you might find something like this that might help them treat your seizures. All right. um, it can be very hard to predict what type of neurologic problems will result from particular problems with, um, with development. As, as I said, half of people who have no corpus callosum whatsoever don't have any neurologic problems. And I've seen lots and lots of people who get sent to me because they, were, they agreed to be in, in a study. Right, there was the you know, UCSD was doing a study on patients with migraines, and they needed 100 people with migraines and 10 people who don't have migraines, and they volunteered to be one of the 10 people without migraines because they got paid $300, um, and they got a free MRI of their brain, and why not? And then the MRI of their brain showed an abnormality, <laughs> and so they got sent to me. No good deed went unpunished, um, and they got sent to me, and they say my my MRI is abnormal. They said I had old injury to the brain cyst. Have a worm. What does this mean? And you say, do you have any problems? 
and they say no, and you say that it doesn't mean any because you've had this for a long time and you don't have any problems, so don't worry about it, right? Um, it, neurology says don't worry about it more than any other spectrum. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, so um, a lot of the time you see abnormalities on the MRI and it doesn't correlate with any behavioral problem the patient has, or patients come to us with lots of concerns about behavior and development and learning and things like that, and the MRI is completely and totally normal. And, you know, and, and we haven't helped anybody, and that, that, that does happen. As a general rule, the things we are most likely to find are general problems of brain development that all we can say is, this is going to make the brain react in unusual ways. So when you see white matter edema like that, you can probably guess that there's something the brain is supposed to be doing that it's not doing as well as the brain normally does. But that's about the extent, and you already knew that the brain wasn't working the way the brain normally was, so that didn't really help. That didn't really help. Um, there are some things that are most that are more helpful than others. So MRIs are pretty good at finding problems with the brain that result in problems of movement because that wiring is pretty clear, right? Big toe to big toe, finger to finger. That's 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 usually pretty clear. Um, if you, this is our brain, we're looking at it through the ear, right? So this is just one half of the brain. The area that controls the leg is in the middle for the top in the frontal lobe. And the arm is next to that. And then the face area is on the lateral side by the temporal, right underneath the head, still in the frontal lobe. So if you have a stroke right here, you are likely to have weakness of your leg. That we can say pretty clearly. But I don't know that that helps anybody to know because they came in saying, I have leg weakness. And we get an MRI and go, hey, we found a lesion right here. I bet you have leg weakness. And they say, yeah, I told you that. Right? <laughs> and, so the, the MRI didn't really help us with that, um, but it did explain it. So MRI does a lot of explaining without a lot of predicting. That's, that, that's absolutely true. So if you look on that straight on view, that coronal view, Here's that leg part in the middle, that arm part on the side, and that face part over here. Um, and so um, uh, different injuries to those areas can produce different problems with those movements. But here's kind of the advanced way to think about it. If you think about the white matter that comes out of each of those areas, they funnel past the fluid spaces in these particular ways, right? The leg area has to come out and go around. Whereas the face area kind of gets a straight shot, right? So if you have a stroke out here, you could get just weakness of the face, but miss everything from the leg and arm. And these are folks who might have a stroke and come in saying, I can't move my face. And you say, yes, you're, you've had a stroke. I can see it on the MRI. And it looks like just in the area where if you had a stroke there, you would lose the ability to move your face. But more importantly for us, is what happens if you have hydrocephalus? If you expand these fluid spaces, just from the picture, can you guess what happens if there's a blockage down here and these fluid spaces start to grow? What gets weak first? The legs. The legs get weak first. And so in children who've had hydrocephalus from birth, they often have weakness of the legs more than weakness of the face and arms. So anybody who has been, whole, been told that they have spastic diplegic cerebral palsy, right, who have fluid spaces that got bigger and as a result injured the areas around the fluid spaces, causing dysfunction of the legs, two legs, diplegia, right, that this is why, because the fluid spaces expanded, injured the leg areas without so much injuring the face and arm connections. That's kind of why that would happen. So if we saw a picture of somebody who had hydrocephalus like we saw before, and they said, guess what problem this patient has? We would say, I bet they have leg weakness or tight muscles in their legs or discoordination of their legs, but I bet their face and their arm move pretty good. We might be more likely to be right about that. The other way to learn that is to ask the patient when they have trouble moving and they will just tell you. Um, and <laughs> Um, so here's a diagram of a patient with here's just showing hydrocephalus, and you can see how the leg areas would just get stretched more than more than the other ones. Um, does it matter when injury occurs? I get that question a lot. The answer is absolutely. So if you think of the brain as like a big library, 
we, everybody sitting in this room, we're old people now, sorry to tell you, um, and we are library shelves full of books, right? So we have a book that says talk. And for 92% of us, 99% of right-handers and 58% and of left-handers, that talking book is here in the left temporal lobe, right? It's, it's, it's slotted in right there. And there's an area of the brain whose neurons are specialized in understanding language. And if we have a stroke, it will destroy that book and the shelf that book was on. And we may never talk again, right? We're, we would have to relearn how to talk. We'd have to write a completely new talking book. And we'd have to do it with neurons that had never talked before, that were doing something else before the stroke. We would have to have them stop doing whatever they were doing and learn how to talk, right? That's what happens when you have injury to bookshelves full of books. But kids are all shelves, no books. When you're born, you're just shelves. And so if you have a part of the brain that didn't develop correctly, or if you had injury when you were young because you had a heart problem and you had a clot go up to the brain and, and injure part of the brain, you destroyed the shell. You didn't destroy the book. The neurons haven't figured out what they're supposed to be doing yet. And what we have found is that the neurons are perfectly capable of doing anything if they're asked to do it when they're that young. So the exact same injury that would result in one of us never talking again would almost never result in a child who didn't learn how to talk. Just a different part of the brain would file the talking book. Now you might reasonably ask to utterly belabor this metaphor more. Um, you might ask, well, will the brain write all the books it would normally write um, and just put them in different places, but then just make one book it didn't write? Right. So if you if you have an early injury to the brain to that talking area, will you write every book, including talking, but maybe you never write of how to write a bicycle book? No. What tends to happen is the brain writes every book it was going to write, but it writes them all 10 percent shorter so that it can jam them all on the available shelf space. So instead of a talking book to 10,000 words, 9,000. Instead of a math book to calculus, trigonometry. Right. Um, instead of I can do this maze in four seconds, six seconds. Right. And, and so that's what the brain tends to do. It is true there's a Dewey Decimal system of the brain. Right. The brain tends to want the shelf think where it will go. But if you injure the brain early enough, it can find other places to put almost almost every book. Um, so it, it's a it's a very very different thing. And um, and when we recommend early developmental therapy for kids who have behavioral and developmental problems, it's because we want to use the shelf space as best we can. Yes? <laughs> so the, in, in this metaphor, the shelf is brain cells that don't have a function yet, right? Because all of the brain cells get to where they are supposed to go by the 20th week of pregnancy. After the 20th week of a pregnancy, we never make more brain cells. None of us do, right? Um, we were every, all of our trillions of brain cells are done and made and will never make more. But the brain cells are sitting there not doing anything. They're not learning, they haven't learned language, they don't know how to ride a bicycle, they, they've never been asked to do a maze. Once you're born, you start doing things. The brain cells start to take on function based on what they're, what they're, what you're learning. And so if you destroy the brain cells that early, the brain still wants to write a talking book. It's just, we'll take it from somewhere other than here in order to do that. It will use brain cells it would have used for something else for talking. Like the capacity, yeah. So the brain cells you have and the connections they have are your capacity. Um, and, and so any injury decreases that capacity, but the brain is amazingly good at fitting stuff onto the shelf. Yes. So in utero strokes, you really don't have an impact because you're so young. So the, it, that that is entirely the case. And, and um, I, 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 if you look me up, you'll find a couple of papers talking about that. So there are kids who have peri in utero or perinatal strokes and don't know it. They're, they're born and they grow up and they develop. And then when they're 52 years old, they have a car accident and they get a, an MRI to see if they have a concussion or something. And somebody tells them, did you know you had a stroke when you were a baby? Right? They never knew. Um, it, 
it, it's, it is true that, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the time, they do have some sort of, of, of issue. But if those if the areas of brain injury miss the motor parts of the brain, it's entirely possible that they that you'll have that injury and never know. And never know. How can they tell if it is a, a stroke in utero? Yeah, they can't really. They can tell it was an old stroke that's years and years old because of the amount of water around it and the scarring and scar tissue and all that. But they can't really tell that it's five years old or 30 years old. But the truth is, half of strokes happen to people who are over about 50. And half of strokes happen to babies, and there are almost no strokes, not none, but almost no strokes from about two years old to about 50 years old. Very rare to get strokes in that window, other than from things like drugs. Yeah. Great. Um, there are other areas of the brain that are important for other things, and injury to them, especially the later in development that they occur, can certainly cause problems. But I don't want to belabor that because it's by far not the most common thing that we're going to see in, 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 in post traumatic event. So my final question as I wrap up is, do I need an MRI? Does my child need an MRI? And my answer is, if you have a new problem, absolutely, right? No, no matter what, if you have a new problem, you should get an MRI, especially if you have a condition that has known issues with the heart, right, um, and things like that. You, absolutely. If you have new headaches, if you have new seizures, if you have always had normal movement and suddenly have you know, new abnormal movements, you should absolutely get an MRI and see if there has been a clot or a stroke or hydrocephalus or something like that. If you have a long-standing problem like hydrocephalus or epilepsy that you haven't had checked up on in a while, an MRI is not that bad of an idea. Honestly, the technology is not that much better than it was in the 80s, but the brain has continued to change over the years of your life. There's no good recommendation about every 10 years or every 20 years, but it's often good to have a recent picture, especially so that if something new happens, you have something recent to compare a picture to, right? You could imagine somebody who had some problems when they were a kid and they got an MRI when they were a kid, and then at the age of 30, they start to have new headaches and they get an MRI and there's something different but was that something different from when they were 10 or when they were 20 or you don't know. So especially if you have a high risk condition, getting an MRI to check in on your hydrocephalus or something is probably a good idea. Otherwise, honestly, as much as we order them, they rarely change our management in anything, right? It, especially if you know your child very well, an image is going to show you something or it isn't going to show you something, but it's not going to result in any and, you know, it, 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 if you, especially if you're worried about a specific behavior, we, we have had a lot of anger lately. There's nothing on an MRI that's going to show anything like that, right? Um, we have had more tantrums or, uh, you know, where it's something like that. Very rarely is an MRI going to be very useful. You're going to get much more mileage out of uh, behavioral therapies and developmental and psychological evaluations than you are from, from taking any pictures. Um, but if, especially if you have one of those new things, seizures, headaches, or hydrocephalus, Definitely an MRI might help you. And that's 115. That's that's what I got time for. Yes. So here's one of the guest honors of this conference. Hello. Kara had a massive brain bleed at the age of 15. Yep. He was in a coma for a very long time. Yep. And he was learning everything. As I remember, she had two MRAs. Yep. To specifically go look into the arteries of yep. the brain. Could she? Ever have another one? I, we haven't had one for. Uh, yeah. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Well, so first. the the question was, okay, a, a child had a hemorrhage um, at the age of fifteen, a brain hemorrhage, and they did a bunch of imaging at that time um, to look at the structure of the brain and to look at the structure of the blood vessels to see if the blood vessels were, you know, made in an abnormal way or if there was a an aneurysm or something like that. Um, do should we get an MRI to check up on that? And the short answer is. If everything is going great and you don't have any new problems, it's probably not going to show you anything new or, or anything that you might need to check in on. But if you've got, you know, uh, new headaches, new any other new problem, I think doing all of those studies again would be a great idea. And getting a checkup of an MRI ten years out, to, you know, to see how that area has recovered, especially so that if something happens again later in life you have a newer picture to compare it to is not a bad idea. Um, because even if you don't have headaches now, you might start to develop headaches in your 50s. And then 
you wouldn't have a good middle picture to know. So, so would it be an MRA? Because that's much more, yeah. I mean, there's a danger to that. Yeah, so, um, so probably you probably wouldn't need another MRA unless the previous ones showed something specifically wrong with blood vessels, right? Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, if there was, if they said, oh yeah, you, you did have an, you know, an aneurysm or something, it might be good to check 10 years later to see if you have a new aneurysm growing somewhere else. But if they think it was a spontaneous hemorrhage or if they think it was from an infection or something like that, they probably don't need another angiogram. MR angiograms can be done without contrast and without needles. Conventional angiograms need needles in vessels and those are dangerous, but you don't even need contrast to do an MR angiogram. So um, that, that is newer technology. So you know, okay. maybe something to think about. Yeah. If you have a case um, uh, where you can't do the MRI, I'm not sure about an MRA, yep. but broken pacing is the wire yep. in the chest. And you do have um, the vessel concern. Yeah. And it's like the group has, um, maybe that's a problem, correct me if I'm misspeaking on it, but um, cause and concern about the vessels. And um, already how long, say, for 20 years, the features are changing. Okay, now what? Okay. So, great question here. So, what if you have a reason to need an MRI, but they told you you can't have one for some reason? So, for example, if you have metal in your body, right, um, you, it, you, it's, you can't really, have, it's hard to have an MRI because the metal could move as a result of the big magnet that they put you in. Um, it could heat up, it could cause an internal burn, very dangerous thing. Um, so two things. One is, particularly for vessel imaging, CT scans, CT angiograms are better than MRI angiograms. So if the specific question is blood vessels, CTs are going to do better than MRIs are, are ever going to do. And conventional angiogram, um, like you have when you have a cardiac problem where they put a catheter in a vessel, that's actually old, good old-fashioned x-ray. They inject a little contrast and take an x-ray, and inject a little contrast and take an x-ray, and then the computer makes the picture out of everything that they did there. So you can get vessel imaging on conventional angiogram or CT angiogram that's better than what you can get with, with MR. Um, the best you can do for a brain picture if you can't have an MRI is a high-resolution CT scan, um, which can be pretty good, but you need to know a couple of things. Number one is, MRI is a beautiful technology because there's no radiation. You're sitting in a magnetic field getting hit by radio waves. That's not dangerous. We're all getting hit by radio waves right now. But a CT scan is high energy. Um, and every CT scan you have makes you just a little more likely to get things like thyroid cancer later in life. So you got to be real careful about doing them. But they can do some pretty high resolution CT scans now that can, that can, that can, that can help. Finally, if you're getting it, if you're worried about epilepsy evaluations and stuff like that, talk to your neurologist and your um, and your neurosurgeons because they have developed some very localized MRI technology. So they have got these new fancy head coils where they put a head coil here and they only turn on the MRI machine down to here. So they don't, so like we have people who have vagal nerve stimulators and other things and that they can't have an MRI to their neck, but we can now do MRI specifically enough toward the head that it decreases the risk to other things. So some people who couldn't have MRIs in the eighties can have new fancy MRIs now that are more targeted and that we know to stay away from. The radiologists have to really protocol it, but they're doctors, right? They're, you know, make them work for their money. Yeah. <laughs> These yeah. fancy words. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, when you have a lot of headaches, yeah. um, what was the sign that was caused the headache and then do we change the way of the So it's the yeah. head, and if you had had an MRI three months ago, you say for the hip, but would they have seen something there that just said a one size fits all MRI was able to have to specifically look yeah. for the issue? So MRIs and headaches, what do they find and, and, and would they help? So first, so MR, headache is the most common indication for MRI, and they almost never show anything. Um, especially if they're episodic headaches. I have a headache, and then I don't have a headache, and then I have a headache, and then I don't have a headache. Th that's not a brain tumor, right? You, the brain tumor didn't come and go. So episodic headache, there's no reason to get an MRI. You're not going to find anything. A headache that has started at a time and been getting steadily worse since that time, you urgently need an MRI, right? That, that sounds like a tumor. That sounds like hydrocephalus. That sounds like something like that. Um, so if they see cysts, if they see hydrocephalus, if they see tumors, 
MRI, you know, that headaches are very important things to find. Sometimes if you have a, a strokes don't usually cause headaches, but sometimes some vascular phenomenon can cause headaches. So vasculitis and things like that can cause a headache. So um, if you've got a headache that's progressively getting worse and not in the come and go kind of way, um, then getting an MRI or even a, an angiogram of some kind to look for vasculitis can be a thing that can be helpful. They probably would have seen it, and it, it probably, you know, the the most tumors don't grow slowly enough that you can not see them for a while. So yeah. almost yeah. never. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Unless they're specifically looking for vascular imaging and vasculitis and things. The general structural MRI is is is, is one size fits all. So I hand back there. Yeah. So if my cousin have not had an MRI before, do they need a baseline MRI? Yeah. So it, my, my general answer to that is it's probably not worth it, right? Um, especially if they're going to charge you for it, especially if they're going to have to sedate the children for it. The risks of the sedation, while very, very small, are still probably greater than if we're going to find anything that's going to change, it's going to change anything, right? Um, and so, you know, if they've been pretty stable or they've been growing in a pretty typical way or they've been growing in a pretty even trajectory, the odds an MRI is going to find anything that's going to tell you something useful is very small. The odds that they're going to say, you have white matter abnormalities. Well, that doesn't really, doesn't really help, right? Um, that said, um, sometimes we say, if they're going to be doing a procedure with sedation anyway, and you've never had one, Sometimes it's another 20 minutes to wheel you down to the MRI machine, do a couple of quick sequences, and then you have a baseline in case something happens in the future. Um, so if you're already having a procedure, sometimes highly in an MRI for a reason of developmental concern, it's a very reasonable addition that doesn't cause any additional procedural risk. And sometimes that, that can be helpful. Uh, so I'll just add that we did a series test that we created for my daughter, yeah. and we did add an MRI. Yeah. Yeah. So perfect. So that's just the sort of way that, that if you can get a two for one on the sedation, um, that that you know that that, that you, know, you get very few bargains in there. <laughs> All right. I think you got more fun and probably right. more interesting people to talk. Uh, I've been a pleasure as always. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have one online you wanted to get to the open? No.